Good morning. Slide is up. I, by way of background, for those that may not have joined us yesterday, uh, I served as the telecoms regulator for the Republic of Singapore between 2000 and 2010. And I've been uh, asked if I would share with you what I will call a case study. Uh, in Singapore, we opened up the submarine cable landing stations, and it has often been viewed as uh, one of the uh, interesting chapters in uh, Singapore's progress in terms of becoming a connected hub. Um, I'll give you a very quick parenthetical note, a side note. Uh, I was uh, involved as uh, one of the architects for the competition framework, the interconnection framework in Singapore, uh, the National Broadband Project in 2006, uh, Smart Cities Initiative, and I've been asked both publicly and privately what was the single most important thing you did in your job for the Republic of Singapore? And I will always point to opening up the submarine cable landing station as being probably the most important thing I did, among all those other things. So I will share with you this case study. And I give you at least a warning before I do this, and that is that I am a strong believer that every country in the world is different. And I'm not saying at all that this approach works anywhere or even everywhere. It is just one approach that we use. And if there's one thing you take away from the discussion, it will show you how, as a regulator, you try to find those opportunities to make a market more vibrant. So with that, the question really was, what, why was this important to us? Well, primarily it was connectivity. We wanted to connect, if you will, the country to what was at the time an emerging and growing need for data capacity. Uh, speakers this morning have talked about the growth of the data. Well, if you're in the 1999, 2000, 2001 era, the advent of, and the requirement for connectivity was growing. There was also an opportunity, and I um, often call this, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, it's the way geographical maps work out. Singapore is actually fairly well situated on the planet. This is something that was discovered by early navigators four or five centuries ago. It's sitting between the Indian Ocean and the South China Sea. So it is a fairly interesting part of the planet. Uh, the opportunity to do this was there. The problem was the mechanism wasn't. Uh, when I talk about submarine cable landing stations, just for the sake of the discussion this morning, we could also impute, we could also imply this deals with satellite earth stations. And so when I talk about this, I'm really talking about a gateway. Uh, I just happen to be uh, more aligned or more on the side of submarine cable landing station because of the value of the submarine cables over the value of the earth stations, which we have quite a few in Singapore. The most important thing to understand is the critical nature of this facility. You have to understand the history, if you will, go way back almost a century ago. What was this submarine cable landing station. What was this cable? It usually was an outpost in the network. An outpost from the point of view, it was far away from where the primary backbone or backbones of a telecommunications network were. It, more often than not, was on the beach. It was as the water started, if you will. But it was considered an outpost. And as a result, when you look and study the history of regulation, because it was an outlier in the network, it was always treated specially by the regulator. It was never considered a critical element, unfortunately, until we saw the advent of the demands of data, which we've actually seen this morning. Submarine cables needed to be protected, though. Uh, the most, and some of you may know, the most dangerous part of a submarine cable is in the proverbial last mile. It's actually about the last 10 miles 
from the water's edge out to the water. That's actually where the shipping traffic or the fishing traffic is more than likely to damage the cable. So the most dangerous part of the cable is actually from the water's edge, roughly about uh, six to 10 kilometers out. Once you get off the shelf and start to go down into channels, then the, the cable becomes a bit safer. It's very important, and I learned this back in 2001, for you to, or for anyone trying to understand submarine cables, to understand the network behind it. And hopefully, in the next few minutes, you'll get a better understanding why I'm saying this. But let me share with you what a submarine cable landing station looks like. And with any degree of luck, yes, I have a pointer. Submarine cables, the sick cable landing station, is probably one of the least expensive parts of the network to build. It is one of the most valuable economic parts of the network to operate. So you have a natural disconnect between the economic value of this asset and the cost of building the asset. And most operators, most landing party operators, as, as Rory mentioned, understand that full well. Very inexpensive to build. Now, there is actually a wet portion of the building now. It doesn't necessarily mean that portion of the building is wet. It's the side portion that faces the beach. And then there's the dry portion, which is the side that faces the country. As you can see from this particular example, we have two cables that are coming in. Rory had mentioned some of the economic and the financial dynamics that sit within a cable. There are at least 10, at least I'm aware of, 10 different models of how you could financially structure the cable coming in. He mentioned you could have a consortium, you could have an IRU form of cable, you could have a privately owned cable. For this, I'm not going to get too complicated in terms of the ownership of the cable. But what we have to understand is as the cable comes into the landing station, that particular X right there is the operative equipment that operates the cable. Once you get out into the sea, it's usually owned by the consortium that is operating the cable. This particular portion actually connects a cable either to one operator or to a second operator. I won't go into the technology of it, but it's crucial to understand this point if you're going to open up to competition what is going on inside this building. The other portion that's actually quite important is most liberalized markets have allowed for operators to co-locate their equipment inside the submarine cable landing station. So if I'm a competitive operator to the market, I can actually house my equipment inside the cable. Very important to understand this part too. And then finally, once I get through my equipment, then I have a backhaul. That my backhaul is defined as getting from the beach into the city, let's say, or into some portion of the network. And then I will operate my network once I'm inside here. So I hope you understand the flow of these concepts because one of the things that I had to do in terms of opening this summer cable landing station up is to understand each of the parts. You'll see how this has a tragic end and then a very happy ending. But the tragic ending, I'll go back to my original slide, part of the, part of the problem that we had was that, and I will actually confess to one and maybe even the largest mistake I made as I put the competition framework together in the year 2000 in Singapore. We had opened up network exchanges as part of the competition framework and what we did in opening up an exchange now, this is an exchange sitting on land inside the, the country's network. What we did was we allowed the operator to offer something called connection services. You're a competing operator, I want to get into the incumbent's facilities. There is going to be a service offered that the regulator will set the price and the terms 
And it is terribly important to understand that we did that. We set the price and terms for connection services inside the exchange. Here is the mistake that I made. We did not do it at the separate cable landing station. We allowed the connection services to be offered on a commercially negotiated agreement. Going back to this particular diagram, connection services, it would be a service that the landing party offers competing customers, and they're allowed to negotiate. Now, how about if I have one separate cable landing station? What is the incentive for the landing party to commercially negotiate? I think the tech model is terrific. I mean, that's, that is a fabulous model. We were after something very different. What we wanted was we wanted a lot of this over here and a lot of that. And by making the market contestable, in other words, given the choice, we felt we could achieve the lowering of price. Rory very properly pointed out, you don't always have this opportunity. We had a fair number of cables coming in, but we had absolutely no competition on the dry side of the separate cable landing station. What we had was essentially a facility that was offered. This is almost going to be hard to believe. But if someone wanted a service, a communication service, between Singapore and I'll pick it to be Bangkok or Hong Kong, the cost of that international service between Singapore and Bangkok, the cost of that service getting from that point all the way out to Bangkok was less than the cost getting from here, six kilometers into the center of Singapore. Now, there's something fundamentally wrong when I have to pay more to go six kilometers as opposed to going a thousand kilometers. The six kilometers is easily accessible. It's network capacity that I can maintain and repair. The undersea cable is dangerous, risky, but I'm paying less for it. There's something fundamentally wrong. So we started to look at this in early 2001. The very first, and I don't mean to get too technical in here, the very first cost for backhaul that the incumbent telco in Singapore offered, the six kilometer backhaul for what was called an SDM1 circuit was over a million and a half dollars. Six kilometers. We started to look at it. Singtel immediately lowered the price to 1.3 million. Now, we looked at what was the price in Tokyo. We looked at what was the price in Sydney. And for the Japanese, the Japanese backhaul is actually rather expensive. But to put it in perspective, remember I just said a million and a half. In Japan, that same backhaul was 25,000 US dollars. So there was something fundamentally wrong with this particular economic model. In terms of the journey that we took, we said that we were going to regulate the price. And this is why I say we had bad news and then good news. The initial bad news is remember I said there was something called connection services. Our first bite at the apple was to regulate connection services. And what we said, what we actually went in, we used pricing models. We used longer range of internet costs to determine the pricing models for the connection services. And we also required the landing party, which was the incumbent telco, required the landing party to offer backhaul. We thought once we issued that order, problem solved. We've now opened up the separate cable landing stations. And how wrong I was. We were easily seven to eight months away from solving this problem. The very next thing we offered, sorry I have to go back to this picture because it's actually quite destructive. Do you see the red lines on this picture? That is actually a cable, a physical cable that sits between a piece of electronic equipment and another piece of electronic equipment. The landing party was generous enough, he said sarcastically, to offer that cable at 25,000 US dollars. You can go out to an electronic store and buy the same cable for $10, 10 US dollars. But if you're inside this landing station, you're going to pay 25,000. 
which means that for every competing bid, if, for example, a large bank, HSBC, offers a circuit between Singapore and London, it's automatically going to be $25,000 more expensive per circuit. So who do you think is going to win every single international bid? So we still haven't solved the problem. Let's tell you what the third one was. We solved the second one. Second one, we can't do that. We have to charge us. The final one that we did, and this was the one that opened it up. When you interconnected from here over to here, and I have to confess, I had no idea what, Camilla probably knows what, it's, uh, what a 703 interface was. But there is an interface that sits within the submarine cable landing station, and there are really two or three forms that you can get. One is actually a very low grade, one is a mid grade, and one is a very high grade. High grade is the 703 interface. Well, the landing party was actually generous enough to offer the lowest grade to the competitors. So you still had deficiency. You still had the bottom. Once we finally opened the third one up, they were fully open. Now, the beauty of this was we actually made this highly competitive here. We had, and, and I actually had made arrangements with uh, one, of the oldest, one of the European operators, actually, to build backhaul. So we actually had a competitive backhaul provided. What was the result? What did we finally get out of all this? We clearly lowered the price. The capacity between Singapore and every other country in the world was at a very, very competitive benchmark. The second thing that we got, which was actually kind of an unknown thing, by 2008, remember I said before we started this in 2001, 2002, by 2008, we had more capacity in Singapore than any place in the world. We were the largest of in the entire world. At the time, it was 50, I think it was 58 or 62 terabits a second. I think now they're up in the 150 range. But the issue was, we got the competition, if you will, on this side. We got the capacity on this side because we basically got the competition on this side. So really to complement what Rory said, Rory was talking about the model. I think it was your third one, which actually talked about the opportunity to open up a cover uh, uh, summary cable landing station is highly dependent on making a contested choice, if you will. So the HSBCs of the world can actually go in and decide who I should provide as my carrier, who should provide my backhaul, how should I cross connect in the summary cable, and which cable do I want. So you've made it highly contestable through this entire model. So I hope you appreciate why I had to show you this fairly tricky diagram because it was drilling down into the dynamics of the network and actually failing two times on this because I thought, I honestly thought after that first time, we solved the problem. And I wasn't even close to solving the problem. So uh, the Singapore model is often seen as, as one, a very an interesting model, but I actually think uh, Rory's point on the tech model is very because not everybody has this opportunity to have 19 cables as we did. Uh, one of the, and I will close with this one point. Uh, we discovered, actually, uh, very late in the day, there's a basic issue with submarine cables. Uh, as I mentioned before, the most dangerous part uh, of a submarine cable is usually within the last five to 10 kilometers as it hits the shore. We haven't had a problem in Singapore for those of, of uh, you that have been, uh, it's the largest container port in the world. So we have literally thousands of ships that are traveling speedily over these submarine cables. The issue at hand is that the number of paths that we have from the submarine cables out into the South China Sea and out into the Straits of Malacca and into the Indian Ocean, the number of paths is only 21. That's it. It's not 22 or 25. They're only because there's so much shipping uh, traffic that's in there. So it's something the, the Maritime Port Authority of Singapore actually is allocated 21 separate channels. 19 are in use. So the point being is that we talk about scarce resources in terms of spectrum and number. We had a fairly significant problem in Singapore. What happens if we got to the 22nd cable application? What do we do with that? Do we auction it off? Do we go back into 
the same mode that we did with the Earth the Sun and the the spectrum auctions. And it's something that we studied and actually came up with a contingency plan. It never happened. Fortunately, a lot of the smaller cables became obsolete. And so they retired. So as a new cable came in, they were starting to replace. So you never, ever get the magic number of 21. So with that, uh, I thank you very much. I hope this was an instructive case study. And uh, I'd be happy to answer questions over coffee. Thank you.